thank you very much, Kenneth. That's, that's very touching, actually. Um, it's really nice to be back here in Copenhagen. I used to, I used to come over here quite a bit um, years ago. I used to come over every year for a reboot. Who's been to Reboot? Oh, yeah, Reboot was awesome. I loved Reboot. Um, but I haven't been back in a few years, uh, so it's really good to have an opportunity to, to return to Copenhagen. Uh, and now I have to make the obligatory remark that as the last speaker, I'm the only thing between you and beer. Um, more importantly, you are the only thing between me and beer. So I'm going to try and make this go fast. The thing is now you, you've, you've, you've had your minds expanded all day long by these amazing speakers giving you this like knowledge bombs and your, your brains are probably full at this point and your bodies are probably exhausted and you're sitting in comfy seats and you're in a dark room and you're probably just going to relax. You're probably going to drift off. Boom! I need to wake you up. Um, let's begin. Let's begin with a creation myth. The creation myth of the internet. You may have heard that the internet was designed to withstand a nuclear attack, uh, which isn't true. Not quite true. What is true is that Paul Baran, who was working at Durand Corporation, was told to look into network architecture to figure out what would be a really resilient network architecture that could withstand a nuclear attack. In other words, if, if particular nodes get knocked out, that the whole network would stay up. And this is where we get packet switching, right? The results of his, his, uh, his findings were that packet switching is this amazingly resilient way of, uh, of, of building a network. And we kind of heard earlier about how this kind of peer-to-peer -peer idea uh, is extremely uh, resilient. And that was this idea of packet switching, breaking things up into individual packets, sending them by any route necessary, influenced Leonard Kleinrock, who was working at the Advanced Research Project Agency, where they were creating the ARPANET, later the DARPANET. And so this is, this is the ARPANET in 1969. There's only a, only a few small notes. The first message was sent on the ARPANET, October 29th, 1969. It was the word log in, but the system crashed after the first two characters. But they, you know, they rebooted it, and they, 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 they worked on it, they iterated, and it's, it started to work, and it started to grow. The ARPANET was able to add you know, new nodes to the network, not following any particular plan, right? There was no preordained shape for what this network needed to look like, and uh, over the years it grew and grew. So this formed the, the basis, the, 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 this idea of, pa of packet-switching network, formed the basis of the internet, essentially created by these guys, right? Bob Can and Vince Cerf. Now, back then, Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf, young idealistic people that they were, they were less concerned with uh, making a network resilient to nuclear attack, but they were very concerned with making a network resilient to other forms of attack. But the kind of attack they were interested in were things like uh, censorship or surveillance or any kind of top-down control. And that's why this sort of uh, packet-switching peer-to-peer architecture appealed a lot to them. And so what they came up with was the internet suite of protocols, most importantly uh, TCP IP. And I think the secret sauce to transmission control protocol or internet protocol is that it's a dumb network, right? It's a stupid network, very deliberately so, and that the network doesn't care about the contents of the packages. The network doesn't prioritize any particular type of content over any other kind of content. And that's, that's hugely important. So TCP IP kind of, kind of just sits below, at the, at the bottom layer. And you can, you can do what you want on top of it. You can add, you can create new protocols. You can create protocols for email, telnet, right? That was another protocol. Gopher, file transfer protocol. And you don't need to ask anyone for permission. You can create a new protocol tomorrow. You don't have to ask anyone for permission. What you do have to do is convince people to use your protocol, right? And that can be tricky, because you want to make use of Metcalf's law, right? Bob Metcalf, who invented Ethernet, talking about networks, he said, the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of connected users, which basically means the more people are using the same protocol as you, the better. This is why, you know, um, you know the very first person who had a fax machine, it, it, was, it was useless, right? But as soon as one other person had a fax machine, it was exponentially more useful. Um, and we can see Metcalf's law in action with the different kind of protocols we've seen on the internet. You know, email is incredibly successful because we all use the same protocols regardless of who your email provider is or who my email provider is. You know, chat, on the other hand, has been you know, less successful because there's competing protocols between you know, AOL and MSN and ICQ, right? Not agreeing on the protocols. But fundamentally, you did not have to ask anyone for permission to just create a new protocol. What you had to do was convince people to use it. And that was the situation with a protocol called HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. 
which was just one piece of, uh, uh, of, of the puzzle, together with URLs and, and initially HTML, that, that form the World Wide Web. This, this new thing that came along sitting on top of the internet. So, created by Tim Berners-Lee, um, sort of late 80s, early 90s. Now, Tim Berners-Lee found himself in an interesting position that he was working at CERN, the most amazing place on the planet. CERN is just, just fantastic. If you ever get a chance to go there, it's, it's magnificent. I mean, they're building the most, they've built the most complex machine in the history of humanity. They're conducting the most complex experiments ever, right? When the, when the Large Hadron Collider is running, right, there's the 16 mile wide ring beneath France and Switzerland. It is the coldest spot in the universe. The amount of data coming out of it is astounding. The amount of data and collaboration required just to build the thing was amazing. And so, trying to manage data and trying to manage information was a huge channel, challenge, even before the Large Hadron Collider was switched on. And this is where Tim Berners-Lee came in. He was trying to solve this problem of, of managing information, which he had tried before. He had, he had had a previous system called Inquire, which was short for Inquire Within Upon Everything, named after this Victorian book of manners, which I always thought would be a fantastic name for the World Wide Web, right? Inquire Within Upon Everything. Um, but that didn't quite work out. This was a few years before the web. So he gave it another shot when he got to CERN. Uh, and this inauspicious document was how he put it together. Information management, colon, a proposal. Uh, and he put this in front of his supervisor, Mark Sendel, who must have seen something in it, because he scrolled across the top, vague, but exciting. <laughs> Which was the go-ahead for the web to be built, right? Uh, and so we got the web out of this little office in CERN, which was, which was you know, and here we are today, right? And right from the start, Tim Berners-Lee, you know, looking at the history of the internet and looking at the history of hypertext and, and, and information systems, knew that the, the part of the trick was not to make anything too complex, right? To, to, to have these small pieces loosely joined, right? Not that any particular part of the system wouldn't get too complex. It's like that old uh, Einstein quote, right? That everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I think he managed a, a pretty good job with these pieces. I mean, none of them are perfect. They're all flawed in some way, but they're all kind of just good enough and just simple enough to, to work. Um, one example, you know, if we focus in, it would be, be HTML. Now, HTML, to begin with, there was no official, you know, version one spec of HTML. There was simply a document called HTML Tags, uh, presumably written by Tim Berners-Lee, which contained the entirety of HTML, which was 21 elements at the time, and even those 21 elements, Tim Berners-Lee didn't you know, have to think them all up. He borrowed what was already there. There was a, a version of SGML, Standard Generalized Markup Language, being used at CERN, and a lot of the elements we use today come from, from that SGML language. So again, he realized the value of, of taking what was already there and building on top of it, rather than trying to create something new from scratch. But here we are today, and we have 100 more elements in HTML, which is, is quite something, and yet, it's still the same language, right? It's still HTML from 21 to 121, um, which I find quite astounding. How is it possible to iterate on a language like that? It seems, it seems like a crazy task. Well, it's down to a, a design decision uh, within HTML, which I think is, is one of the smartest things, um, and one of the smartest design decisions ever made. So if you think about an HTML element, we'll take a, you know, just a regular element. Uh, there might, there's no attributes in this particular example, but you can imagine you have some attributes within the opening tag. Right? You've got an opening tag, you've got a closing tag, and you have stuff in between the opening and closing tag. And by default, a web browser, let's say it's a graphical web browser, will render uh, what's in between the opening and closing tags. Now, it might do something else, depending on what the element is. Right? It might add some default styles uh, for certain elements. It might add some default behavior for other elements. Uh, but the standard behavior is you just you show, you display whatever's between the opening and closing tags. You all know this. This is not new. Where it gets interesting is when you give a browser an element that it doesn't understand, right? You just make something up. It's still got an opening tag, it's still got a closing tag, it's got stuff between it. The browser displays what's between the opening and closing tag. So what's interesting here is what the browser does not do. The browser does not throw an error to the user. The browser does not stop rendering the HTML at this point and refuse to render the HTML document any further. It just ignores what it doesn't understand, renders what's in between the opening and closing tags. That's enormously powerful. That's how we managed to get from 21 to 121 elements. Because we were able to add new elements into the language 
secure in the knowledge that we knew exactly how older browsers would behave. They would simply ignore what they didn't understand and display the content in between the opening and closing tags. It made it safe for us to evolve the language, to add in new elements. And we could kind of flip it on its head, too. Okay, if we know that the behavior of older browsers is to simply display whatever it sees between opening and closing tags it doesn't understand, we can use that to our advantage. So when you have a you know, fairly complex element like Canvas, you can deliberately put content between the opening and closing tags that's there for the older browsers, right? Some sort of fallback. And that's not by accident, that's by design. The Canvas element started life as a proprietary element by Apple. And other browser makers saw it and said, we want some of that, that's, that's a really good idea. Let's all do that. I mean, this, this happens all the time in, in standards work, right? Somebody does something proprietary, and then everyone copies them and agrees it's a good idea. This is how we got XML HTTP requests, right? So Canvas started life at Apple, but it started life as a standalone element, right? Like, like meta or link or image. It didn't have a closing tag. Once it goes through the standardization process, it gets the closing tag specifically so that we can do this, so that we can safely use Canvas and still you know, be able to accommodate older browsers expand upon the language. I like that design pattern. It's another design pattern in HTML I, I like even more. Speaking of standalone elements, the image element is a standalone element, which, which is kind of problematic. It's kind of why we have the alt attribute to put the alternative text instead of an opening an image tag and a closing image tag. There's an interesting history behind the image, image element. There's, there's old mailing list emails from like the start of the web when people are beginning to face, make, make web browsers, and of course it was only text at the beginning, right? And uh, somebody starts to say, you yeah, know, I, I think we should have some kind of images in there. And the, they're debating on the mailing list, like, should it be called icon? Should it be called object? You know, what will we call this thing? And while they're debating, Mark Andreessen, who was working on the Mosaic browser, like, this is before he turned into some kind of um, libertarian terminator, he, he, he writes a message to the, to the email list, and he says, oh, I've, I've, I've shipped it. It's called IMG, it takes an SRC attribute, and it's now shipping in Mosaic. And everyone else went, okay because they had rough consensus, but more importantly, they had running code. And you know, it works, it works fine for a while, but then it started, it's sort of bumping up against the fundamental flexible nature of the web, right? Especially when we got responsive design. So if the web is, is this fluid medium, you put text on the web and it just fills whatever space is available, but as soon as you put an image, or at least a bitmap image that has you know, an intrinsic width and an intrinsic height, it's kind of it's battling against that, that fluidity. And so we need to solve that, and we have solved that with responsive images. And what I like about the design of, of its responsive images, and we were seeing some of this earlier with the, the Edge uh, implementation, um, is that the source attribute has to remain. Right? So we get our new source set attribute where we can put, oh, here's the, the, here's the URL for the version of the image that's, that's uh, twice as dense or three times as dense, four times uh, as dense. But you must still include the source attribute. So, so by design, it's been, it's been made in such a way that you, you, can't, you can't just target newer browsers. You still have to have something inside you know, the source attribute for the older browsers. Same with all the other bits of responsive images we got now, right? with the picture element and the source elements inside there. And you can put your media queries inside there. And you can put more source sets inside there. Great. But you still have to build it on top of an image element. And in that image element, you must have that source attribute. I like this, right? I like this, this way of thinking, the building on top of what's already there, much as the web did. So all of this is possible because of the way that HTML treats stuff it doesn't understand. If it sees an attribute it doesn't understand, it just ignores it. It doesn't throw an error. If it sees a you know, tag it doesn't understand, it just ignores it and renders whatever's inside. So it's got this very kind of lax error handling, and that's how we get from 21 to 121 elements. And CSS is pretty similar. Um, CSS has also got this kind of lax error handling where you can just throw stuff at it and it won't complain if it doesn't understand it. So you, you know, stop and think for a minute about all the websites out there, how amazingly different they look, how, how just the, the, the crazy cornucopia of stuff we have on the web, all of them using CSS, and yet all of that CSS basically boils down to one little pattern. This one pattern. Selectors, properties, values. That's it. A little bit of character, special characters in there for the machines to understand it. But fundamentally, this simple pattern is, is how CSS works, um, which I find really impressive that it's such a, a small, in my opinion, beautiful pattern can scale up uh, to, to the, the cornucopia of websites we have out there. Now, like HTML, if, if you give a browser some CSS it doesn't understand, it just ignores what it, doesn't, what it doesn't understand. So you give it a selector it doesn't understand, it basically just doesn't match that selector, and so it, it skips over 
whatever's in between the curly braces. You give it a property it doesn't understand, it just skips that line. Same if you give it a value it doesn't understand. Again, what's important here is what it doesn't do. It doesn't throw an error, and it doesn't stop rendering the CSS. And so CSS has been able to grow over time. We've been able to add new features to CSS, again, secure in the knowledge that we know exactly how old a browser is going to behave with that. And here's the interesting thing about CSS, I think, in recent years. If you were to think about the most important developments in the world of CSS, I think it probably comes down to two things, in my opinion. You might disagree. One is preprocessors, right? It's fundamentally, I think, the way that most of us in this room write CSS is probably different to the way we did five years ago. Who uses a preprocessor in this room? Right, OK. So preprocessors, big change. And the other big change has been in methodologies, right? Like object-oriented CSS and SMACs and BAM. Uh, let's see, anybody here using OOCSS? Anybody using SMACs? Anybody using BAM? Quite a few. Uh, did I miss any? Shout them out. No? OK. But here's what I find interesting about both uh, preprocessors and these methodologies is that in both cases, the people coming up with these techniques and these ideas didn't need to go to a standards body. They didn't need to petition anyone and say, please, please implement this in CSS. Right? In the case of preprocessors, it's because it's on your machine. All, right? All the magic kind of happens before it goes out onto the web and you, you convert it into CSS. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a writing tool. In the case of all these techniques and methodologies, oh, CSS, Max, BAM, all of these, they're still using good old you know, selectors, property, and values. In fact, they're pretty much only using selectors. And at that, they're using a real small subset. It's generally, we're talking about the class selector, right? So even though these techniques have only come along in the last few years, what I find interesting is that the potential for those techniques was there all the time, hiding in plain sight inside this tiny, simple pattern. Right? There's no reason why somebody couldn't have come up with any of these techniques 15 years ago. I find that kind of amazing that, uh, that, that, I, that was there the whole time. It's kind of like when Douglas Crockford sort of came up with JSON. It was, it was there inside JavaScript. He just kind of uncovered it. It makes me wonder what else we're, what we're missing that's, that's right in front of our eyes. So in the case of um, CSS and HTML and the way that they treat stuff they don't understand, right, by just saying, yeah, it's, it's fine, don't worry about it, I think it's, it's an example of the robustness principle or Postel's law. Right. It states that you should be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you accept. So in the case of web browsers, they're being, they're being liberal in what they accept. You give them something that's like, you know, badly formed HTML or some element it doesn't understand, or badly formed CSS, it's like, yeah, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. Right? And that was because of John Postel, he coined this, this law, and he was working on, on networks. He was working on the internet. And he was talking about, you know, when you're sending the packages around, if you're receiving packages, and, you know, it's, it's or datagrams, as they call it. And if it's, if it's not well-formed, but you understand the contents, it's like, don't be a dick about it. Basically, it's, it's what Postel's Law is saying. It's like, you understand what it is. You know, don't be, don't be too strict. Um, but you want to be conserved in what you send, right? You want to be a good citizen. And that's certainly the way that, that web browsers are acting uh, when it comes to, to interpreting HTML and CSS. And I feel that it, CSS and HTML can get away with that. And, and the reason they, they can get away with that is that there are de they're declarative languages, right? So the author of CSS or HTML isn't providing step-by-step -step instructions on how they want something to be achieved, right? They're just declaring, well, this is what kind of content I've got, or this is the kind of uh, uh, styles I would, I would like. They're, they're suggestions more than anything. And so they can, these declarative languages can have this lax error handling. I think that's a lot more tricky in, in the an imperative language, any programming language, basically, can't really have that same loose error handling. I don't think you'd want it to. It'd be incredibly hard to debug a programming language if you made a mistake and said, ah, don't worry about it, it's fine. <laughs> right? you'd be, that, would, that would not be good. Um, so, so overall, and this, you know, this is going to be a bit of a broad sweeping generalization, but overall, I think that the declarative languages tend to be more resilient right, because they're, they're resilient to change, whereas imperative languages are a bit more fragile, and, and rightly so, they need, they need to be. Now, what I find interesting is that uh, what I notice over time is that we tend to figure stuff out and hack stuff together up at the top of the stack in the, in, in the, the, the imperative languages, right? We're polyfilling stuff, figuring stuff out. Uh, and if it's a, a common use case, a common scenario, it will find its way further down the stack. So if you think about when, when JavaScript first came along, you know, the first use cases were, were mouse overs, 
right? You had navigation and you'd mouse, you'd mouse over it and it would swap out an image or something like that. It would change the color. Uh, and now we do that in CSS, right? We do that with, um, with the pseudo classes. Uh, or the other use case we had for JavaScript when it first appeared on the scene was uh, form validation, right? You can't submit the form until you fill out that required field, stuff like that. Now we do that in HTML, and we can do that by simply writing an attribute, like required. So over time, what you tend to see is we, we figure stuff out, out higher up in the imperative level, and, and it, it finds its way down. It sort of seeps down into the declarative level, which I think is good because uh, not a broad sweeping generalization, but I think that these declarative languages tend to be easier to learn. They have a, a, a shallower learning curve than an imperative language. It's, it's programming language is going to be fundamentally a bit, a bit tougher to learn. So HTML has got this resilience to it because of declarative, and yet we went through a period where there was, there was a chance that HTML could have gone down a, a different route and could have become fragile. Oh, some people remember this, yeah. XHTML2, this is about 10 years ago. So, I mean, we had XHTML1, right, which was, that was simply HTML adopting the kind of um, writing style of XML. Because in XML, all your elements have to be, you know, your tags have to be lowercase, your attributes have to be lowercase. Whereas HTML actually doesn't give a shit whether you use uppercase, lowercase. You know, in XML, you must quote all your attributes. HTML actually doesn't, doesn't care. So XHTML1 was just simply, let's, let's reformulate HTML with this kind of, you know, stricter style of XHTML, but you could still make your mistakes and, and it was fine. XHTML2 was going to be completely different. First, they were going to deprecate a load of stuff and simply the, the image element, that wasn't going to exist in XHTML2, despite all the content that was already out there. And yeah, if you made one single error in your HTML or your XHTML, then the browser would throw an error to the user and the browser would refuse to render the document at that point and refuse to render any further because that's the error handling of XML. It was much more draconian in its error handling. Uh, so completely violating Postel's law, right? This, this, this error handling model for XML. And developers took one look at this and said, no, <laughs> no way, that's insane. Why would we ever put this out on the public web? You know, one unencoded ampersand and it's the yellow screen of death because you know, that's the error handling model. Uh, so we collectively roundly rejected having a more fragile error handling model for putting content on the web. Yeah, here we are. And now we're putting everything on the web with JavaScript, which as I said, by its nature, has to have this fragile error handling. Uh, I don't get it. <laughs> I remember a while back, uh, the website for downloading Google Chrome. This is, a, this is quite a while back now, but uh, there was a period when, when nobody in the world could download Google Chrome, which, you know, is a pretty big mistake. Um, and the reason was because that, that button there, it's a link to download Chrome. It wasn't actually linking to something like, oh, I don't know, a file containing Google Chrome. Um, it was linking to the JavaScript pseudo protocol, whatever that means, not really a valid hypertext reference at all. So you're kind of taking the, the fragile imperative part of the stack and shoving it into the declarative part of the stack. And, you know, there's, there's an error somewhere in the JavaScript is basically what happened. Probably completely unrelated. Probably, you know, hundreds of lines later, somebody's got a misplaced comma. But because of the error handling nature of JavaScript, this, it fails because of that. Um, it, they fixed it after a couple of hours, but, you know, I'm pretty sure heads must have rolled. And it all seems so avoidable to me. Um, it seems avoidable if we stick to another, another law, another maxim, and that's Murphy's Law that anything that can possibly go wrong will go wrong. He was, he was an aerospace engineer. Because he took this attitude, he never had any fatalities on his watch. And I think today we've heard a couple of reformulations of Murphy's Law, right? Um, Alex uh, had a great quote by Tyler Treat, that failure is not only an option, it is an inevitability. Right? That, that's basically Murphy's Law. Uh, and Patrick was quoting uh, Sam Newman. So that baking in the assumption that everything can and will fail leads you to think differently about you, how you solve problems. Uh, and I think that's key. It's like, like, yeah, let's, let's not assume that everything's hunky-dory and fine, especially if we're dealing with a language that has a more fragile error handling model. Um, and let's assume that things can go wrong. Stuart Langridge has put together kind of a, a flowchart of all the things that can possibly go wrong uh, with JavaScript. And, you know, some of this might be on the server and some of this might be on the client. Some of it might be on the network in between. We've heard a lot today about, about how, how problematic that can be. Uh, but the point is that, you know, these things can happen, so therefore these things will happen at some point. And it's, we're not talking here about visitors. We're not talking about, like, there's a certain percentage of, of your visitors that will, you know, not get your JavaScript. We're talking about visits. 
right? So everyone at some point is going to fall prey to, to one of these problems. Uh, and if it happens to your HTML, well, that's not so bad because of the error handling model. And if it happens to your CSS, that's not so bad because of the error handling model. If it happens to your JavaScript, well, it depends entirely on how you're using that JavaScript. So I think because of the error handling model of JavaScript, we should assume that you know, things at some point will go wrong. It's not like we're, we're not hoping that things are going to go wrong. Right? That's not why you test for and make things resilient. It's not because you hope something's bad going to happen. Right? I mean, think about car manufacturers. Right? They strap crash test dummies into cars and smash them against walls. You can't imagine a car manufacturer saying, yeah, hang on, we're not going to do that anymore because our plan is actually not to have the cars driven by crash test dummies, but we're going to have them driven by humans. Also, we don't think people are going to smash them into walls. We think they're going to drive them on roads. So. Uh, we're, we're not going to test. It would be insane, right? Of course, you hope that you know, your cars are going to be driven on roads and will never smash into a wall, but you want to hope for the best, but you want to be prepared for the worst, right? So with that in mind, I'd like to propose a, a three-step process um, for doing exactly that, for, for hoping for the best, preparing for the worst. This is how I approach building for the web. My three steps, what are mine? Here they are. One. Identify the core functionality of whatever it is you're building. Two, you make that functionality available using the simplest possible technology. And three, you enhance, right? Three steps, sounds fairly simple. Let's go through those steps one by one. First, identifying the core functionality. Now, this is where you kind of got to step away from the surface level functionality of like, you know, things in a screen and how people, you know, interact with them and think about what's the actual task that people are trying to accomplish, which very rarely has anything to do with a specific gesture or specific technology. Um, so this is basically about setting your baseline. What you decided every single user must be able to accomplish. And remember, we're just talking about the core functionality. You can't have all your functionality in here. You've just got to decide now. You've got to prioritize what's most important in what you're building. So let's take an example. Let's say you're providing news on the web. OK, well, I would say that the core functionality in this case is to allow people to read the news. Very straightforward. Uh, let's say you're providing some kind of messaging service where people can stay in touch with their friends. They can, you can see messages from their friends, and they can send messages to their friends or to the whole world. Well, there again, you know, the core functionality is to allow people to send and receive messages uh, in, in a social way. If you're building a photo sharing service, the clue is in the name, that people be able to share photos. That means being able to, to see photographs, not being able to, and being able to provide photographs, again, to, to people they know out there. Uh, and if you're building some kind of collaborative, you know, writing, editing, sharing uh, tool, then being able to write something and being able to share that, being able to edit it, those will be the, the core functionalities. OK, so you establish what the core functionality is of what it is you're building. The second step is that you make that functionality available using the simplest technology. Now, this is actually a kind of tricky to, 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 again, to step away from what you hope the final version is going to look like, going to feel like, going to behave like. And just think about what's the absolute core functionality. So if it's serving up the news, well, you know, simplest technology for that is, is plain old HTML, right? That you structure your content. I guess plain text would even be, would even be simpler. But on the web, we can go a bit further and say, let's, let's wrap it in, in HTML elements and give it some structure. Uh, if we're talking about messages, uh, we want to we see messages, presumably you know, reverse chronologically. Uh, we've got HTML elements for that. And we want to be able to send messages. Well, the simplest way of doing that would be simply a form, right? Simple input. Now, I know the experience is going to suck, right? The experience is going to be pretty crap, right? You, you have to submit a form every time, press, press submit, full page refresh. But these technologies, right, input, and a list, that's going to be available to pretty much every web browser out there. You're trying to set your baseline as low as possible. And remember, there's always the third step to come. Likewise, we've got a photo sharing app. I want to be able to see photographs. That's what we have the image element for. And I want to be able to provide a photograph. So again, forms to the rescue, an input type goes file, right? restricted to images. Again, crappy experience, but accessible to everyone. And finally, if you're going to be you know, writing, well, something to write in. That's it. Um, so this would not take long, right? These, these first two steps, well, figuring out your core functionality actually can be, can be quite tricky. But 
deciding what the technology is to do it, it doesn't take long at all. This is where the magic happens in step three, and this is, this is where you'd, you'd spend most of your time. It's like, okay, now that you've provided the baseline functionality, and you can you know, rest secure in the knowledge that you've built something that's accessible to everyone, now, now we have fun, now we enhance from here. So if we're providing news, we've structured it in HTML, well, we could enhance with, with layout. Right? And it might seem strange to think of layout as an enhancement rather than something that's intrinsic to the content, but it is an enhancement. In fact, if anything, what responsive design has taught us, if you're doing it right, right, the mobile first, content first responsive design, is that layout can be treated as an enhancement. Start with your structure, right, your content, you structure it, and then layout for the screens large enough to take the layout. And if it's going to be a nice reading experience, you're probably going to want to provide some custom web fonts, and so you can suggest those web fonts using add font face. I say suggest because, again, remember, CSS is the declarative language. You're declaring what you'd like to happen, but you are not providing step-by-step -step instructions to the browser on exactly how to render things. Um, if you think about it, every line of CSS you write is a suggestion to the browser. Okay, so now you're enhancing and you're having fun. Likewise, you know, on your messaging service, you can provide layout using CSS, you can provide custom fonts using CSS, and you're probably going to want to use Ajax at this point so that, to avoid those full page refreshes, um, so that when somebody sends a message, they don't have to get the full page refresh, they can, they can just send it, and we just update part of, of what's in the browser. And we can do it both ways, right? When, when there's something new on the server, we can use WebSocket or, or, or WebRTC, whatever, whatever is the most suitable technology, uh, to receive the messages, right? And so now we're, we're building up. And if any of these fail, it's not the end of the world because we've built something that works for everyone. Horrible experience, but it works for everyone. Providing a photo sharing app, right? People can view images, people can upload images in a clunky kind of way. Well, let's, you know, let's make that better. We've got things like the file API so that as, as the image arrives right into the page, right, we can do stuff with it immediately. Like we could start applying uh, CSS filters, right? People could, could start playing with that image right there in the web browser using technologies that aren't supported everywhere. But you know what? That's okay. Right? When you're building this way, it's absolutely fine that these technologies aren't supported everywhere. Uh, and if you're building this kind of collaborative environment, it's thinking about you know, the network as this, this, this problematic part of it is going to be pretty important. So, so some form of local storage, I mean this in the generic sense of the term, not a specific technology, but some way of storing stuff uh, you know, locally rather than relying on, on the network. And of course, everybody take a drink because service worker is, is the, the obvious. Everyone's kind of said everything there is to say about service work today, but I just want to reiterate that this is probably the technology I'm most excited about right now. Um, everything that, that Paul said, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. This is, this, this is uh, awesome. And the way that you can use it, you know, I was talking about the, how much I, did, I like the design of the image element and responsive images, right? The way that we build on top of what's already there. And service worker, the spec, is deliberately designed that you have to use it in such a way that you're building on top of what you've already got. Right? It's, it's designed that way. That you, can't, you can't really rely on service worker. You, that initial hit, right, when someone first visits your site, you have to provide something in that first, uh, first render. And you know, service worker doesn't get you out of that. But once they're there, if service worker is available, holy hell, can you enhance the experience for the user. Right? You can really go crazy. So I'm very excited about service worker, both in terms of what it can do and in terms of how it's been designed. Uh, I think it's a really, really great example of design. So those are my three steps for building on the web. And uh, what I like about this uh, three-step process is once you get in this mindset, it's scale-free. And by that, I mean it applies at the level of the, of the service you're providing, right? whatever, whatever um, business you're in. You can, you can use this three-step process. It also applies at the level of a URL. Right? You ask, you know, what's the core functionality of this URL, this page right here? How do I provide that core functionality using the simplest available technology, and then how can I enhance? How can I add the extra stuff, the bells and whistles on top of that? It can even apply at a level below that, like a component within a URL, within a service. Um, Scott Jail was talking about this on the Filament uh, Group blog, about you know, something like providing directions or providing a location to people. Well, the simplest technology might be an address, right, text. Uh, you could you know, enhance with uh, providing an image for browsers that support images. And you can enhance by providing interactive Google Maps for the browsers to support that, right? Layering on top. So this approach, this three-step approach, applies at these different levels. The, the, the entire service, individual URLs, patterns within those URLs. And I think that this kind of breaks the Gordian knot in that instead of debating about whether we should be building using the most basic technologies or whether we should be building using you know, the latest and greatest technologies, 
You build with both. You have your cake and you eat it too. You start by building with the simplest technologies, and then you start building with the, the more advanced technologies on top of that, and you've got this, this baseline, right? So it's not a battle between either providing basic functionality or providing immersive, rich experiences. It's both. You provide basic functionality, and then you provide the immersive, rich experiences. Now, there's resistance to this idea, and the resistance kind of boils down to, to two, two camps. The first camp is, this is too easy. As in, like, it sounds too good to be true, and also it just wouldn't work for my particular use case, right? Now, there are certainly situations where this don't apply. If you're, if you're building Angry Birds in a web browser, you're going to need hit detection, you're going to need animation, right? You're gonna, there's probably too much going on that you could you know, boil it down to some HTML elements. Okay, fair enough. But most of us aren't building Angry Birds in the browser. You'd be surprised, if you get into the habit of, of thinking this way, of how much you can boil down to, to simple stuff like this. But this idea that, you know, it's, it's too easy, it, it won't scale. I've heard that before. When we were all using uh, tables for layout, font tags, and then the web standards group came along and said, come on, we should use CSS for layout. Um, people said, well, you know, that's CSS for layout. So that's fine for your little blog. That's fine for your cute little portfolio site. But it would never scale to my large corporate website. Uh, and then Doug Bowman came along with the Wired redesign, and, and Mike Davidson came along with the ESPN redesign and showed, oh, yeah, actually it does scale for large-scale corporate sites. Likewise, when Ethan came along with responsive design, you know, a lot of the initial reaction was, yeah, that's nice, Ethan, for your little blog, your little example, but it would never scale to, you know, large-scale large -scale websites. And then the Boston Globe came along, and then Microsoft.com came along. Right? And said, oh, you know, it does actually scale. So there's an opportunity here to be the Boston Globe, to be the Microsoft.com of building apps in this way, where you, you know, people get the best of both worlds. But uh, you, know, you get that pushback. It, it, it sounds too easy. The other pushback you get is it's too hard. Right? This sounds too hard. And the reason for that is like, whoa, 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 hang on. Step one, I'm identifying the core technology. Then I build it. And this step two inevitably involves, you know, probably some client-server interaction, right? You've got to have something on the server that's going to handle that input, that's going to do something with it. And then I get to step three, and what, do I have to you know, recreate all that functionality again, but now I'm doing it in the client, right? All that work I did in step two, am I just like, throwing that away for 95% of my users? Uh, and that's a fair point, actually, in some ways. I will point out that we're just talking about the core functionality. Right? It's not like you're implementing everything here at step three. Um, that you did on the server. Like, the basic functionality you might decide to repeat or keep it on the server, whatever you like. Again, this isn't a battle between, oh, the client-server architecture or the peer-to-peer -peer architecture. Like, do both. Start with client-server, then enhance to peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, but I think the people, with, when, when they react like, oh, this is too hard, this is not going to work, they're probably thinking of an existing service that they've built, where they jump to step three, and think, oh, shit, how would I retroactively, you know, just provide something that works for everyone at the most basic core functionality, I think that would be really hard. And I agree, if you're trying to retroactively shoehorn this process in, it's going to be really, really hard. It's kind of like if you've ever had to retroactively try and make a site accessible, it's a lot of work. But if you build with accessibility from the start, it's a, it's a piece of cake, right? It's, it's not a problem. It's kind of the same. Once you get into the habit, uh, it's actually not that difficult. And again, this is like, you know, when we were moving from uh, tables for layout to CSS, the first time you did it, it was really hard because you were used to tables for layout, but then you got used to using CSS for layout. And the first time, you know, if you're used to building fixed width layouts, when responsive design comes along and you try making a flexible website, it's really hard the first time. The second time, it's not quite as hard, and the third time, it's definitely not hard, and then it just becomes normal. So you kind of do need to exercise that muscle, and I will say that maybe the first time you try to do this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough because you're not used to it. And there may be technological solutions that could help with you know, resolving this, this issue, like, well, if you're, if you're using JavaScript on the server side, and then you're enhancing with JavaScript on the, on the client side, maybe you can reuse the same code, right? Isomorphic. Um, but I, I think, I don't know, I don't think it's a technical issue. I think it is much more about how you, how you approach these things. Um, but that's not how I see most websites being built, which I think is a, is a crying shame. Like, here's nasa.gov. Now, if I were applying my three-step process to nasa.gov, I would say, okay, well, what's the core functionality here? It's, it looks like it's uh, it give me uh, updates from NASA, mostly in the form of, of text, some images, maybe video, right? And I think, okay, well, how can I provide that in the simplest possible way? I'd send text and images and video from a, from a server using HTML. Um, but actually, the experience for quite a few people visiting nasa.gov is this kind of a sneak peek of what deep space is uh, going to look like. Because if anything happens to the JavaScript uh, between the server and the client, this will be your experience. Um, 
which I find a crying shame, right? Because it's just, it's just news, it's just text and images and video. Why, why is it putting this, this single point of failure in the way? Um, you know, we heard earlier about 80 requests being, being a, an average. This is 139 requests, and it comes to 6.7 megabytes in total. And if you think that that blank screen is probably an edge case that isn't going to apply to most people, I think it applies to quite a lot of, of us, you know, especially if we're on shitty hotel Wi-Fi or some other less than optimal situation, because I found the problem. Three megabytes of JavaScript <laughs> to render text and images. Right? That's, that's insane. Three megabytes of JavaScript, which is blocking, as we know, before you get anything. Now, I do not enjoy, you know, poking my finger at some other site and saying, eh, you're doing it wrong. Right? I, I get no pleasure from that. But this disturbs me because the URL is nasa.gov. Right? Taxpayers' money paid money for this. Right? They paid for this. And Lord knows, you know, NASA is strapped enough for cash as it is. Uh, you know, that there are more sensible ways of, of, of spending that money. Um, you can do whatever you want in your own site, right? But when it's, you know, it's a government website, I, I just feel that that is wrong. It, compare that to the government website in the UK, gov.uk, where they have enshrined in their design principles that if you build pages with the idea that parts other than HTML are optional, you'll create a better and stronger web page, right? That's more resilience. My fear is that the reason why people would reach for a three megabyte JavaScript file to render some text on a screen is that it's convenient. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not using developer convenience as a derogatory term. I actually think it's hugely, hugely, hugely important. If you, you know, talking about when the web first came along, the trick was to actually try and get people to use it, right? Developer convenience is, is, is hugely important, but not at the expense of user needs. If I'm faced with a problem and I have the choice that I can make this problem the user's problem, or can make it my problem. I'll make it my problem every time. I don't think it's fair to make it the user's problem. Now, most of the time, these are not in opposition. And there are other factors to come into play. Business needs, right? Sometimes business needs do clash with user needs, advertising being a prime example of that, right? But I would like to think we've got some kind of priority here. Like in the HTML design principles, that the priority of constituencies, right? In case of conflict, consider users over authors, over implementers, over specifiers, over theoretical purity. I would like to think that, you know, when my design agency is building websites, that we prioritize user needs, maybe even over business goals, over developer convenience, that developer convenience would, would come further down. Um, but that's not what I'm seeing. And like I said, I totally understand that because uh, developer convenience is hugely important. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of tools out there. If, if you do want to make a, a something that requires JavaScript to render some text on a page, there are loads of tools to help you do that. It is quite convenient. There are fewer tools to solve the problem of having you, you having to think, what is the core functionality? How do I make that core functionality available with the simplest possible technology, right? But you know what? That's why it's called work. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have a magic solution. But sometimes you've got to do the work. And I could, you know, console myself by thinking, well, th this is okay. If, if most websites are, you know, using, you know, loads of requests and big JavaScript files and massively invasive tracking and advertising, thing, well, that's just because 90% of everything is crud, right? Sturgeon's Law, Theodore Sturgeon, the, the sci-fi writer, he didn't, he didn't say crud. Um, I could console myself with thinking, like, it's fine. 90% of everything is crap, so of course 90% of websites are crap. In fact, I could kind of think, hey, maybe I've got a competitive advantage here. If my agency is building in such a way that, you know, we're thinking of the core functionality, providing that to everyone, and then enhancing, do we have a competitive edge on the people, you know, valuing uh, developer convenience more? But I think the situation is actually more like the tragedy of the commons. The web is, is, our, is our commons. And it doesn't matter if you can hold your head up high and I can hold my head up and say, well, I've never put a three megabyte JavaScript file on a page just to render some text. I've never put invasive tracking on a page. I've never used, you know, 139 requests just for one URL. It doesn't matter if the general perception of the web is that it's slow and bloated and buggy. Even if you haven't made any websites that are slow and bloated and buggy. It's, it's, you know, this is our commons. And it seems like um, we're always, you know, we're, all, we're being given these features all the time and we're never quite happy. We're always like filling to expand, right? Give us more bandwidth and we'll just fill it up with more JavaScript, right? There's always something we're not happy about. Just waiting for us like, uh, you know, 
there's these consensual hallucinations we used to have back in the day, right? It was like, well, we began making websites that were 640 pixels wide, and then at some point we said, no, no, everyone's got 800 pixel wide monitors. It's safe to build, you know, fix with 800 pixel wide layouts. And then we settled on this magic number of 960 pixels for some reason. You know, we said, no, let's all agree that that's fine. And at the same time, we're probably all agreeing that, you know, everyone's on broadband now. It's safe to think that. These are all assumptions, consensual hallucinations. And we've got the same assumptions today where it's like, well, let's just assume that JavaScript is available for everyone. Let's Let's assume that everything's going to be fine on the network, right? And it's time to, to think of Murphy's Law. And you know, things are never going to be perfect. As Alex, you know, quoting the William Gibson quote, the future is already here, it's not evenly distributed. It's never going to be evenly distributed. There's always going to be something you want that's not here, here and just get used to it, right? It's like in the early days, like, oh, as soon as we have more than 216 colors, then web design is going to be awesome. As soon as we can use more than the system fonts that come on the computers, then, you know, things are going to be great for the web. As soon as people just upgrade from Netscape 4, everything will be fine. If people would just get off IE6, it's the users of Windows XP that need to upgrade, and then everything's going to be, if people would just upgrade from Android too, then everything's going to be great, right? It's like, there's always something. We got all those things, and yet we're still not happy. Well, I want 60 frames per second, uh, right? There's always something. My friend Frank Camero wrote this great essay called there is, a, there is a Horse in the Apple Store, which describes a real-life situation. We walked into the Apple Store, and there was a tiny, a tiny horse in the Apple Store. Well, you know, he writes about how amazing that is, but what's more amazing is the reaction, or lack thereof, from everyone around it, who are not seeing the horse in the Apple Store. And he's taken to calling these things tiny ponies, these amazing things that are in plain sight that we just don't see. And you know what? The web is a tiny pony, right? It's, it's staring us in the face that, the, you know, everything we need, we've got it. Exactly what Paul said, that middle bit, URLs, that's where our power lies. I just want to reiterate exactly what, what Paul said about that, right? The links, the power of the link. We need to use that, and we can build a resilient web. Thank you.